Hi, I'm singer, songwriter, DJ and presenter Melanie C. You may know me as Sporty Spice, one-fifth of the Spice Girls. Our debut album Spice was the best-selling album of all time by a female group and we sold over 85 million records. I've been a solo artist for some time now and I released my latest self-titled album last year. I've co-written 11 number ones, more than any other female artist in chart history. Welcome to a very special edition of Music Life on the BBC World Service, a show which brings together musicians from around the globe to discuss how and why they make their music. We've now recorded a hundred of these shows. That means nearly 400 singers, producers, dancers, visual artists and performers have popped in to have a chat and share their experiences and unique perspectives on life as musicians. And to celebrate this milestone, this week we're looking back at some of the best conversations from the series so far. Coming up, we'll hear from the likes of Will I Am. Country stars Jimmy Allen and Mickey Guyton, composers Max Richter and Hans Zimmer, South African superstar Moonchild Sonelli, sisters Nora Jones and Anushka Shankar, pop rock bands Haim and Tune Yards, pop stars Becky Hill and Emily K, icons David Byrne and St. Vincent. But first, we'll start with an episode that I hosted in September last year with MC Nadia Rose, singer-songwriter Ray Morris and songwriter, musician and label boss Jin Jin. What an incredible experience that was. I've been lucky enough to work with both Nadia Rose and Ray Morris and hoping that I'll be working with Jin Jin at some point in the future. A wonderful insight into why they make music, being a female in the music industry. And we had so many similar experiences. It was a really lovely chat. Check it out. How important is the dynamic in a songwriting team? How does writing with different artists, songwriters affect the sound of a song? I think Jinjin, I mean, you know, we know you so well as a successful songwriter, writing for so many artists. I think maybe let's come to you first. Um, yeah, I think the dynamic is so key because as a songwriter, you're stepping into the world of the artist, you know, and you, you need to remember as well that it's their story, not necessarily yours, and you're there to help them bring their story to life. It's kind of like speed dating and going on lots of tinder dates or whatever but yeah it's all different it's like okay cool should we do it again sometime should we get do a second date oh i don't know Call but do you know that's so funny because i use the dating analogy a lot yeah because i believe when you have your like your first time collaborating with yes. you know whether it's another songwriter or a team it is like a first date. And I mm -hmm. often believe you get the best song the first time you work together because everyone's on their best behavior. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, you know, obviously you can go on and have a lot more great sessions with people, but I've often found that that is the case. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're so right. You know, I have worked with incredible A&R on my new record and he's been so clever at putting me together with people you know, not only that works stylistically and the energy's right, but also personality wise, because you can work with some of the best songwriters and producers in the world. Mm. But if the vibe on the day isn't right, yeah. you know, it just doesn't work. It can be quite an, an awkward experience, can't it? Yeah. It can be horrible. Mm. So, um, Nadia, we've had the pleasure of being in the studio together. We had a lovely time, didn't we? <laughs> I can't believe that you're saying that. Like, that will always be um, <laughs> wild to me. As you know, I'm a super Spice Girls fan. Getting in with you was um, incredible. And then, yeah, what we managed to achieve was far beyond what I thought would happen. I thought I'd just be stood in a corner, just <laughs> trembling like a leaf. Oh, <laughs> I think what was interesting about our session is that we were such an odd mix. You know, it was you, me, Polo Duffy, who's an incredible songwriter, legendary status, all coming from quite different worlds musically. It just worked, didn't it? And it felt like, I think, you know, what's so important, I know everyone's going to relate to this, is like as an artist you are vulnerable Very you know you have to be and feel in an environment like you can say anything and not be self-conscious but yeah we definitely had that we we just said any old rubbish didn't we and it turned out quite good <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I think it's a banger sometimes it can be quite awkward if the if there's like personality clashes or you're in worlds so far apart that you can't meet somewhere in the middle we definitely made it work we just 
meshed and everybody had equal input. I can't wait to do the next one. So Ray, we had a lovely session, a lovely few sessions together. Do you feel that sometimes you can be kind of pulled off your own direction? From my experience, when I first started writing songs, it was it was a really solitary experience for me. And I would just sit at the piano and, and write alone. I actually didn't collaborate with anyone for, for quite a long time. And so I got really set in my ways and I was actually quite nervous about the idea of collaborating with people and so when I first started doing that kind of speed dating thing where you knock on a kind of weird warehouse door down a back alley and there's a strange lucky man you've never met before at the age of kind of 18 19 it's a pretty bizarre thing to be doing and then you slowly start to go okay I think I'm going to meet that person for a cup of tea before I just go and spend an entire I don't know, 18 hour day with them. And that's what I loved about when we worked together, Melanie, because you, you came around for a brew and we sat and, and just chatted and got to understand what was wanting to be created as well, really. I think that's very important. Yeah, it's, you touched on something really interesting there because before Nadia and I worked together, we took a, a car ride together, didn't we? We drove to the studio together we and did. that was our little bonding time. I was thinking about being a woman in music. You know, we find ourselves quite often in really intimidating situations, you know, whether it's, well, petrifying situations, whether it's going out on stage, whether it is, it's turning up at a stranger's door to go and, you know, you would never allow your child to do that. Right? Mm-hmm. And, you're, and, it, and often in my experience, it's a dude. I have worked predominantly with men throughout my career in music. I think it is a shared experience. I mean, Jinjin, you know, you have worked with with lots of people. Do you feel that it's still male dominated in, I suppose, in the writing and the producing, um, you know, as well as behind the scenes in in labels, etc. Do you know sometimes when you go to mm. like the states or other other countries, you know, you actually see more women coming through, like in more executive positions. So I've recently been on a quest to find a lot more female producers and there's so many like young ones up and coming as well that I've been like trying to reach out to as you say we always have to kind of like be fearless suck it up and have a word with ourselves before we enter a room or knock on a strange door or go into a meeting and pretend that we're more confident than, than we really are. With my experience you know starting in the industry in the mid 90s there's definitely improvement, but it feels like baby steps, you know, it's so, so slow. At the end of the day, we're creating, we're making music. If you're working with males, females, gender neutral, you know, whatever, it shouldn't really matter. But I do feel like women in music still need the support. So yeah, any young female aspiring writers, producers, musicians, video directors, engineers, the whole, you know, gamut of of what you can do in the music industry is huge. You're listening to BBC World Service, and this is Music Life. I'm soul singer, rapper, and producer, Aloe Black, joined by Grammy Award-winning jazz vocalist, Gregory Porter, multi-instrumentalist, singer-songwriter, Kadia Bonet, and pop singer, Chelsea Jade. Gregory, what is your writing process? Yeah. I'm such a fan of your words. That's the first thing to me that matters. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I collect these moments. I collect them on my phone. I collect them on a pad. And then when I come to the writing session, I come with a bag, with emotions, with all of my pains that I've, like a gerbil, I've stuffed away in the sack of my jaw. And I'm... I'm collecting my friends' conversations, my pain, the things that I've been moved by in the media or in my life or in just the stories that I read. But I tend to try to write truthful things and things that move my heart to both tear and joy. In the same way, I'm writing down different ideas, thoughts, couplets throughout the, the days, weeks, months. And when it comes time to sit down and write, I have all of these sometimes very disparate and disconnected ideas and thoughts that ultimately I can synthesize to make sense of. But then there are times where one very strong idea comes to me and I and I am able to put it all together as one. Can you, you know, name a song from one of your recent projects that had a, a, 
a lightning rod kind of impact on you and, and it just flowed. I've got to say this. Yeah. Concord. I was on a plane on my way to, to London and I was in the midst of a 200 and... 30 some concert year. Mm. So I was zing, zing, bing, 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 bing. And um, though my family is coming to see me on the road a bit, I miss the, the entirety that is family. That's place, that's, that's home, that's brothers and sisters. I, I missed it all together. Although I'm in the air and I'm flying, I'm doing fun, TV, radio, Aloe Black, all this cool stuff. <laughs> The dopest part is being at home. So it's basically three or four in the morning, up in the air, all the other passengers asleep. And I had to get this idea of my desire to be on the ground, to be rooted. Wow. That had to come out, yeah. How about you, Chelsea? Mm, I'm constantly doing that. The, the phrase coming in hot, but not so bright. That was my um, experience of America when I first came here is uh, <laughs> <laughs> was like a, an assault on the senses. I, I mean, it came from a very small and very sparsely populated island of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. mm. I was like dumbfounded by this bright sensory experience. Right. It, it took some maneuvering to kind of find a way to deftly start to move through it so that I could be myself again, you know. So the song that I wrote, Laugh It Off, is, is kind of about knowing what to put stock in and what not to. That first line is what that was all born from. Right. Cardio. There's been like a, a couple of times where it's really happened like all at once like that. But the second wind on Child Queen was one that happened like very quickly. I was overwhelmed with humiliation. <laughs> I had just had a performance. I was so tired of feeling like I wasn't performing at the level that I wanted to. I just went home and like crumbled into a ball and didn't think I was going to ever do it again. And then a half hour after being a mess about it, I started like thumbing around on the guitar. I think I just sat, sat there at the computer and recorded for like eight hours or so. And that's pretty much the record that's on the album because when I tried to like go back and refine it it was kept on losing something so it ended up being pretty much just that first right word vomit <laughs> situation <laughs> no I feel you <laughs> being a multi-instrumentalist do you feel compelled to play all, like as many of the sounds and instruments on your project do you can you give up some of that to other musicians on second wind I felt like I needed to play everything and I think it was just because it was such an emotional, raw thing, and it was really particular what I wanted. But other times, like, I'm really happy to let somebody do it well. <laughs> I think it just depends on like the feeling that I'm after and if it's something that I can translate well to somebody else or not. Absolutely. I feel you on that. I'm like, I might be able to pluck these three chords, but my, <laughs> my piano player will choose the colors mm -hmm. and arrangement that's going to make this sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. For, for me, I, I, I waited f until I found the musicians that were willing to come with me. Uh, mm -hmm. There's many times when I write a song about my mother, I talk about my mother for a long time. I'm sure they get tired of it. But we're like, guys, we got to have a drink before we do this. We get into this song because I need to talk about who she was. And they've always gone with me. I'm so thankful to my piano player, my drummer, the guys that have been with me for over, over you know, 13 years now. They've gone with me emotionally. It's musicianship to support the story, the theme, mm. the aim. I always think about Songwriters Hall of Fame. I think Gregory certainly, after listening to your music, smiling, laughing, and bawling tears to your music, Damn. I feel like you are <laughs> destined, destined to be in the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Are uh, you hung up on originality? Do you think I just need to be, I need to be original? Or are you more like, I'm just doing what comes natural? You know, I, I'm like Chelsea. I think I'm, I, I love what, what you do, Allo, in, mm, in terms of writing and collaborating with a bunch of, with people and friends. 
I'm a gregarious person. I have lots of friends, but I don't write with any of them. Right. And, and that's not by choice. It's just, I don't know, it just has happened that way. Probably because I write at 4 a.m. in some plane underneath <laughs> a blanket. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, get under this blanket and write a song with me. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> but my point is, these things come to me in very strange places. You're listening to BBC World Service, and this is Music Life. I'm South African musician and dancer Moonchild Sanelli, joined by DJ and producer and entrepreneur Kapi, trumpeter, composer, and band leader Etuk Ubong, and Ghanaian musician, singer, and producer Bright. Has being open caused you any problems? No, it's love with me. <laughs> You want to do that one? You wanna, how important yeah, is it to be yeah. open? You know, let, come, let's go, Bryce. Come, Tell us, banana. Um, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what? Um, so, Kapi <laughs> used this word, um, grow. It's very important as an artist, you know, mm -hmm. because, because when you start the way music, for me, I, I started very early. Like, the first time I entered the studio was, like, on the 10th of June, 2005. Yeah. That was when like I had my voice being played back to mm -hmm. me. Back then I was just doing it for, for my friends yeah. and let's say myself. As I was growing, you know, I, I started re realizing that, you know, my music has to, you know, come with um, a message, has to have, you know, content, you yeah. know, that like people from, from everywhere can relate to. Moving from just Accra, growing up, I used to li listen to a lot of high life, hip life, you know, which is like a mi mixture of high life and hip hop okay. but i moved to the uk last year i just realized that people think different people see things differently yeah. i had to adjust to my environment and then and then see what is ha happening around mm -hmm. i do uk based funky i do go on, you know i i was in the studio with you yes. and then imagine if i was just saying something just that a Ghanaian can understand it will be it will be difficult for like for like other people to relate so so i feel as an as an artist you need to be open enough you need to you need to be willing to learn i had to start <laughs> doing stuff that i've never yeah. done before you know so yeah well, that's lit yeah you really have to be open yeah when you want to go far yeah Doug, what do you think you have to understand also the nigerian system or the african system once you come out and you start saying the truth they usually find a way to like cut you off yeah you don't get a lot of airplay which mm -hmm. doesn't really bother me because after our bbc plays my music and some other radio stations in europe a lot you know and i know that you know nothing can really yeah. stop the truth i don't know how not to say the truth as much as yeah. i can you know <laughs> so mm -hmm. i love that i just want to jump in you're really uh -huh. giving a took you're taking us to kalakuta uh, <laughs> yeah that's the um, <laughs> I think, yeah, you know, Nigeria, historically, when you look at great artists mm -hmm. like Fela Kuti, um, a lot of music is powerful mm -hmm. and has been used to transform lives. When we look at what's been going on around the world, you know, with Black Lives Matter and how important creativity has been part of that, it just mm -hmm. shows like it reminds you that music is so powerful and as artists we have the tool to evoke change yeah so it's a balance between entertainment and empowerment that's true i definitely have been in trouble in, in trouble for my lyrics because i immense myself in that character of whatever it is that i'm saying like for instance with one where I'm talking about false prophets, but it's such a nice song, you don't know what I'm saying, and the lyrics don't even tell you I'm saying that. I'm just telling you the story of my naivety, right? I mean, I've been in trouble for say, calling thighs in the Kosa language, and it wasn't even derogatory, it's the actual word in the dictionary, but someone felt uncomfortable because now it was more about liberating and empowering and making people feel fine because I feel like a lot of the times people have to be broken down and then are forced to love things they don't necessarily love and therefore creating an idea of I could never be like that because that is perfection and it will never exist within me, which is not. So that song was like one of those things. So I've been definitely in trouble because radio didn't want to play it in SA, in South Africa. The beautiful thing is that I spoke to people on social media and they flooded me with mus with videos of them owning their bodies and you know what I mean? So it wasn't necessarily a derogatory song at all. It was just a song about owning your 
your body. I mean, we won because it's playing now. So I have definitely been in trouble, <laughs> but I have won the fight. <laughs> well, I win with every song because it's always, they always feel like it's a risk, but it's beautiful. You're listening to BBC World Service, and this is Music Life. I'm composer Max Richter. I'm joined today by composer, cellist, and vocalist Hildur Gonadotia, and composer, multi-instrumentalist, and educator Angelica Negron, and finally, legendary composer Hans Zimmer. Hildur, I want to ask you about when you're writing a score specifically, how do you go about the emotional texture of the world you're building? How do you zero in on that? Well, I think there's no one way of doing that. I think every project is so different. With films, every story under the sun is being told and, and every story needs something very different. So I try to just, like Hans was saying, about having the conversation with a, with a director and then, well, I mean, it depends on the production, of course, like how many people are involved, like how many people you need to have a conversation with. <laughs> if it's like, you know, if the conversation also involves yeah. producers and, and, and God knows who. And exactly. <laughs> people in the street, you know. Exactly. People they just met. Exactly. But I think it's, 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 it's really about tuning into what each story needs. I mean, it's, it's really different between every project. So if you take these two projects that you were talking about before, Mm. I mean, Joker was very much like a um, a character study of this one person that's going through all of this turbulence, and and I thought it was very important to really be inside of his head and to go on this journey with him, and that the music was kind of really led led the way into his head, basically. Right. And and for Chernobyl, I felt it was it was really important for for the space to have a voice. Like I felt it was really important that that the, the character that we can't see or we can't grasp the, the radiation, that the radiation really had a voice and a place within the series. And, and, and I felt to be able to, to understand what radiation is like, I really felt like I needed to experience it and for the space to transmit that feeling of, of, of radiation. So that's why I thought it was important to not have any instrument to over-dramatize somehow the, the voice of the radiation, but to have it speak for itself, basically. This idea of the score only being illustrative, but in some way sort of personifying the site. I think, it's, I mean, I, actually, funnily enough, I did something a little similar with Ad Astra. The journey in Ad Astra is from Earth to Neptune. And I figured out that we've actually made that journey. So the Voyager probes made it. So we have data every nine seconds. So we got this data from the University of Iowa and made these instruments from the data so that when Brad is flying by Saturn, you're hearing material from Saturn. Oh, That's so beautiful. Cool. I is, didn't know that. It was like, it's such fun, Wonderful. right? That kind of thing yeah. is such fun. Yeah, it's also just so great when you can take the opportunity to learn something during the process. Like, I love that the most when you can, when you can really dive into something that you have no idea about. Hans, I wanted to ask you, you're, you're in a kind of world building mode, I guess, at the moment. I am totally in a world building mode. I'm working with a welder, mainly, making me instruments. Nice. We are... It's Dune we're talking about, but let me just go back quickly. This idea of talking to people or how many voices you have that have influence on what you do. I limit it, and I, I limit it very much on purpose, and everybody knows. It's the director, it's the cinematographer, and it's the editor. And the cinematographer is the most important person for me. Absolutely right. Because I want to know what the colors are. I want to know what his color scheme is. And just as he has problems describing colors in words, I have problems describing music in language. You know, some of the things we do, you do, I do, we, we all do, if you play them too early to somebody at a studio who is hoping for their big summer hit, mm. you're just going to get fired. And the whole point is you have to have people have confidence to let you finish the journey, mm. you know, and, and, and take it from there. And I'm actually rather fond of previews. I mean, I, I encourage previews where I try things out, where I shove things in front of an audience and see if, uh, you know, if, see if they all run out with their hair on fire or if, yeah. uh, how far <laughs> we can push it. It is interesting, right, when you're sitting there in a preview and... I, I always sit, you know, near the back so I can just see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People are, you know, you can just yeah. see their body language. It's so fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> and you know when it's not working. The vibe in the room, right? Yeah, you don't, you don't need to have a conversation about it. 
Just come back to your studio and rewrite. You're listening to the BBC World Service and this is Music Life. I am singer and songwriter Rina Sawayama, joined by Philadelphia-based singer, songwriter and musician Shamir, South African performance artist, producer and singer Angel Ho, and American rapper, poet and activist Mickey Blanco. Do you make a conscious effort to be or sound original? Or is your music slash aesthetics just what comes from the heart? Mickey, I wanna I wanna hear from you. I think if one has to make a conscious effort to be original, you might be in the wrong business, babe. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a good point. Exactly. I, I think that I think that for me, my biggest journey has been composition. I, I started out, you know, doing performance art and and doing a lot of things in the art world and I always wrote. I was always a writer. Writing has been what's bolstered everything that I do. I've written for other people. You know, I've developed mm-hmm. so much within my own writing. But I think that the part of my music that I, I saw that I really needed to spend a lot of time on was production and and just really kind of understanding a certain level of musicianship because it really started to feel as if okay, you know, what am I what am I doing if I'm not able to transcend some of the other things that I've done. For me, my journey has been so much right now about songwriting. With with this new album that I created, I really got my music for the first time to a really transcendental place. And for a long time, I knew that I needed to shift my music away from being youth-centered and to being really universal because hip-hop doesn't age well. I'm 34 years old now. I've always kind of been really aware of the fact that, like, hmm, like, I really need to center my music in in certain things that are really timeless and that are really classic and, and that feel reinvigorated without having to feel amateur or immature or have themes that only appeal to a, to a certain age group. I think that's kind of been where, where my head is at. That's so interesting that you mention the age thing because I'm turning 30 next week and I signed my first, well, I put up my first pop record at 29, which for a female is basically like saying I'm 64. (laughs) Um, And I've actually gone, I guess, maybe similar to you, but slightly different is that like, I've just focused so much more on the songwriting and yeah, making it a little bit more universal, even though if the production is a little crazy, I've definitely put a lot of pressure on myself to shift the way I write. It's interesting, all these sociological things that affect even the way we write and create and allow ourselves to express what about you angel i'm definitely an original but the thing is like because like mickey blanco i'm also not classically trained in music i've just like always been doing musical theater and performance growing up but back to that thing anything goes really anything goes for me that's my originality And when you look at anyone who is also emerging or anyone in your circle that's also creative or anyone, I don't know, I guess your peers, do you ever find yourself comparing yourself to them? No, um, I used to compare myself to people, but now I don't. What changed? I don't know. I, I really, I really just felt like I needed to stick to being myself and being completely like honoring my creativity and not like trying to please people with it or anything. Just ki- mm. I always want to give something new. That's that's all I want to do. And you, Shamir, is it all conscious what you do? I think for me, it's um, kind of two minds about it. I was already given this very unique voice. <laughs> uh, so there's not much I can really do about that. And then also just like aesthetically, that's definitely not conscious at all. But I do I do make somewhat of a, of a conscious decision to make sure that my music itself is extra original. When I'm writing a song that feels too familiar, I just disengage and I'll throw it out. Or like maybe save the melody for like a different chord progression that I feel doesn't feel as obvious. Just those small little things I am conscious about because... I don't know. I don't like things that feel too familiar. And I think that it would be great for any songwriter to kind of like make that conscious decision a little bit. Like the perfect example is like on my own. I wrote each part relatively quickly, but it took two, a year. Yeah, two years to make from writing to recording, but like a year to write because I made the instrumental. And normally when I write, I do the instrumental, the chord progression, lyrics, everything all in one go. And if I can't, I also disengage. I don't I don't come back to it really. But I really love that instrumental and I kept coming back to it every now and again over the, the next year. 
but every kind of like melody or like whatever that I would put over it, it just felt too familiar and I I didn't like it until I had to go through like this breakup where the lyrics and melody just kind of like poured out and it was just perfect and I was like, yes. A year later, like almost exactly a year later. Oh my so. goodness. People think that we just co- sort of conjure up songs and it just happens out of nowhere. And some songs are like yeah, that. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's amazing. But then there's some songs where I'm just like, oh, yeah, it doesn't sound right. This is not good enough. And then you you don't know whether you're holding on to the demo so much and that's why it's not sounding good. And songwriting is such a fascinating, deep subject that everyone has different ways of doing. You're listening to BBC World Service and its music life. I'm reggae and dancehall singer Cranium, joined by LA based multi instrumentalist singer and rapper Mesego and London based singer songwriter and rapper Adikar Harley. Now, this question is one of my favorite questions and um, it means a lot to me. And I can't wait to hear your guys' response and see okay. how you guys um, respond to this. What's more important, working with a big name and ending up with an okay track or working with a small artist and getting an absolute fire track? No, I want you all to really think about it. You know, we're not, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna pretend, we're gonna be a totally honest and we're gonna be straightforward. And um, the reason why I love this question is because I've experienced this um, multiple times. So um, I'm gonna ask it again. What's more important? <laughs> Working with a big name and ended up with an okay track are working with a small artist and getting an absolute fire track. And I want to flip it a little bit too. But let's start off with, with, with that um, question first. Uh, Miss Ego. So I see my songs as like a, a permanent piece of a museum, right? Mm. And so I want to do something that special with someone that I want to invite to my museum, invite to my home, meet my mother. So I'd rather collab with the the small artists and we have an amazing song together. Mm-hmm. Because though the big name is great, sure lots of money will come from that, they might not show up to the festival mm-hmm. for the feature. They might not come to the release. They might not, it might just be strictly transactional. Mm-hmm. And from my experience, I don't like that. Okay. Because I I don't care personally. Okay. I'll take the small song. Okay. Okay. I like that. All right. Okay, let's go, my boss. <laughs> How do you feel about that? How do I feel about that? Um, yeah. So the, the good thing is that it is, there has been situations like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I would obviously say that I want I want a good record. Everything I do, I want I always wanted to to make it the best. I'm not gonna say it's always, it's not gonna always be someone's cup of tea, but I'm gonna make it my best. Ideally, I would go with a better record. You said that you you didn't say that um the big artist's verse was rubbish. You said it was okay. There's mm. a lot of okay verses from big artists. Okay, still works. So so but you, you we still have to answer though. So you go with the bigger <laughs> artist. <laughs> um, and depends on how big. Um. It's fine. No worry about it. Trust me. In, different, in two different worlds. In two different worlds. Mm-hmm. In two different world, worlds. Yeah. I would go with. Yeah. Yeah. It'll you know, it depends. It depends. But there's a lot of technicalities to it. Though. Listen, it's an artist's job, big or small, to make the best decisions for them. No, we're living in a time where people fail to understand that if you're not truly beneficial to me, I don't have to go 100%. When you say you have a record in front of you and you're the artist, mentally, you want the best for your product and for yourself. If I was in Cranium, where I am big enough to can and have the tunnel to work a record, I would go with the bigger artist. In my position that I'm at now, I've done ton of records with artists who is not as big. You understand? Because now I feel like I'm at the place where I used to be at that place and I want to get to Wherever that you part. Want. So, you know what I mean? I know how to like, okay, this record. So. Anybody who ever linked me for a record at this point in my career, I always say, let me hear the record first. Because if I like the record, I'm going to do my verse a thousand percent. If I like the record and he is a big artist, I'll turn it down, which I've done a lot of time. People look at me like me crazy. Like there's records when I turn down where I won't call him, where people look at me like, yo, you're sick. But mm-hmm. it's just that the record is not good enough for me and I don't want to attach my name to it, not because of a big name. You're listening to BBC World Service and this is Music Life. I am Ginny Beth and today I am joined by Colombian-Canadian singer-songwriter and record producer Tay Shi, Welsh electronic musician and producer Kelly Lee Owens and Canadian electronic songwriter, producer and vocalist Jesse Lanza. 
What was the first song you ever wrote, if you can go back? <laughs> Kelly, what was oh. your first song? Do you remember? Well, I had to do, I took GCSE music, but bearing in mind, I couldn't read or write music. You know, I tend to do these things. I throw myself into things. And um, I ended up writing a really dodgy acoustic guitar thing with, with, with a guy. But really, I just, I just wrote the vocals and the lyrics. And I just said, can you just write me this, mate? Because I need to get this through, you know? <laughs> Uh, I need to get above a C and let's do that. And that just kind of um, put me off a bit for a while and thought, oh, this can't be it. You know, this is not that fun. And then I found a cupboard full of 50 djembes and my music teacher was looking after them secretly for a friend. She wasn't supposed to be in, the, in our high school. And I just said, is it okay if I make like a composition, African drumming composition with them? You know, because I feel like that's just, it just feels so visceral and so natural. And I, I loved drumming. And so mm. um, my first composition in a sense was recording 50 djembes um, on, onto MIDI. <laughs> nice. M mini disc, sorry, not MIDI, mini disc. Wow, which mini Which shows disc. a little bit of my age. Yeah. Then <laughs> after some time, I ended up doing some sessions with Daniel Avery for his yeah. album Drone Logic. And actually, the first song I ever wrote was Keep Walking, which was for Dan's album and ended mm. up uh, being on my album because it kind of just fitted better. It's funny how meeting people can change, you know, uh, the way you write music. And uh, that's interesting what you just said about, you know, starting your journey, writing songs, and then suddenly you meet someone and then there's something changes in the way you write or your experience about it. Jesse, yeah. let's go to you. Yeah, I mean, do you remember the first song you ever wrote? I was thinking about it. I'm like, what was the first song I ever wrote? My parents were both musicians. So they were, my dad was always encouraging me to write songs. So I have like a so many bad seven-year-olds. I think I wrote a song that went like, life's too short to think about tomorrow, wow. which I must have just heard somewhere and don't really believe. I <laughs> That's yeah. pretty deep for a seven-year-old. God, I wish my song was that great. <laughs> very deep, very philosophical. Yeah, really for a kid, for sure. I don't, I was obviously just heard it somewhere and thought, maybe I should write about that. Was it on a piano? Or? Yeah, so I started on piano and then I had like one of those similar to, Kelly, I'm going to reveal that like my age and that I had one of those recorder boxes where you put a tape in it and you press record and play at the same time and you and that's how I would whatever works, you know. Yeah. <laughs> to, yeah, exactly, because it was around and but yeah. Do you still have those machines? No, I don't know. The first machines you recorded yourself. I think it with. got thrown in the garage at some point and then the mold got in and then it got tossed, you know. I don't I don't have that one. Cuz I know some uh, artists who still keep, you know, the first machine they always worked. I remember PG Harvey showing me her four tapes record oh machine that she still that's, uses to write songs. That's amazing. Wow. Can you think? Can you believe yeah, that? That's incredible. Yeah, I wish I still had wow. that thing cuz it would be cool to record ideas that way although it's quite big mm. it takes up a lot of space yeah actually that leads me <laughs> to another question that, uh, but at first I want to I want to ask Tay about her first song that she ever wrote kind of similar to Kelly actually like my earliest memories of writing songs are from six seven eight years old in my diary I always kept diaries and always would write lyrics and make up little melodies and stuff so mm. I definitely have a couple of those songs that will like pop into my head every now and then from that era. And they were just really simple kind of, you know, little kid trying to write a love song about you're not spending enough time with me. Why are you hanging out with that? <laughs> how do we how do we do that? At like seven or eight, I literally have a post-it note, which is like, baby, ooh, you're hurting me. And like, I was like, I'm literally six yeah. years old or whatever. Like, how, how do I even know? Yeah, that was kind of, that was definitely like my start. I also had one of those boom boxes mm. around when I was nine or 10 and I would record myself on little cassette tapes on there, just singing and coming up with ideas. And that was where I started. Do you still have that boom box? I think it might be somewhere, but I do still have a couple of the tapes that survived. Mm. Yeah. I, I actually, my leading question to that was, do you think that objects like that have a soul? Mm. If you go back to them, do you think there will be something particular or you don't believe in objects having history and that influencing the way you write? Yeah, I mean, soul is a tricky word. Maybe mm. like there's definitely a spirit. Yeah, there's something to that for sure. Mm. But there's like maybe an essence or something. I'm asking this because I was recording with Flood in the studio and uh, someone, the technician, was explaining where the desk was coming from and who had recorded it in on it. And then he came in, he was like, we don't care. Shut up. We don't want to know about that, the history. It's just a machine. Well, I think sometimes it could put pressure, but yeah. Ah. Oh, I disagree with that. 
objects like capture parts of people's let's call it souls when used to create something i do feel like when i listen back on you know on like a tape of when i was nine and singing and i feel like the most kind of elemental like parts of me are definitely Mm. in there maybe it's what we're projecting to it yeah that's a really interesting (laughs) question but i i believe in like the history of what's captured in an object for sure that it kind of goes beyond just the function of the object. In terms of history, do you often think of, uh, for example, how uh, when you're going to use a drum machine, do you research about who's used it? And is that sometimes a reason why you would go to a synth or because you've heard it on a certain record? Yeah, absolutely. I bought an MPC because I knew that DJ Rashad used them and I just wanted to make music that was like his so badly. So I went on eBay and I got one. But yeah, that inspires me to buy things all the time. I feel like I'm the opposite in a sense that it's not that I, I don't appreciate like what's been done with synth or so, but I always go with whatever sounds good to me. If it happens to be an 808, which it is, and it always sounds great. And the warm rounded sounds, you know, of an 808 is, is just something I gravitate towards. And I ended up using like the Korg Monopoly on everything I've done. And that's just because of the sound that it, I can get from it. There's so many happy accidents that come out of yeah certain pieces of gear and like it's funny because we think of machines as perfect you know we think of machines that never doing mistakes but actually you seem to say that working with machines is actually a conversation with them especially if you don't know how to use them all that well <laughs> <laughs> yeah which yeah. I well, can really <laughs> so is that the innocence of the beginner that is creating this chaos and enabling mistakes oh yes. definitely yeah it's very yeah. punk it's a punk <laughs> attitude I think so yeah exactly yeah. it's DIY punk and that could, that, that could be brought into electronic spheres. Like, I think that's what we're realizing. You're listening to BBC World Service, and this is Music Life. I'm musician, producer, DJ, and composer Nithin Sawney, joined by musician and songwriter Nora Jones, composer, producer, and sitar player Nushka Shankar, and composer and saroth player Shemik Dutta. Beethoven, in the last years of his life, created his great greatest work, and yet he'd become totally deaf by that time. And it was interesting that he actually copied down scriptures, Hindu scriptures, um, in 1816 when he was 46. And I find that really interesting because from that time on, he created such incredible work. And the listening that I think he did was internal. And he found inspiration from so many different things outside of actual sound. And yet he was able to translate that into music, which I, I find so fascinating. I mean, do you, do you feel that there's an internal voice that you listen to as much as your music? And Nishka? It's not just music that inspires my music. I mean, obviously it's life and emotion and lived experiences, but but I find it incredible how much all forms of art can can inspire music. And it's hard to define how, but like for me, watching dance is one of the most inspiring things. Like there's just something about an incredible human body, you know, the, the top level artists, you know, whether it's our, our friend Akram Khan or Sidi Larbi Charkawi, these people dancing just takes me to this place that reminds me of what's possible. And I, I couldn't mathematically define how that inspires me then in my music, but I know there's a direct link between watching them dance and then and then me being able to play anything yeah, beautiful at all. That, well, that makes a lot of sense, <laughs> particularly with Akram and Shimik. You worked a lot with Akram Khan as well. Mm. I mean, how do you find that when you're actually yeah. performing with him? Do you feel do you feel that really feeds into the way in which you play? Is Shimik? Absolutely. I mean, performing with him, is you're definitely in, a, in the presence of an energy that is probably even beyond him when you work with dancers in the rehearsal rooms and in the studios it's that mirror you know that mirror and for for ages it was just like oh my god that's so so vain to have for for dancers to have a a mirror in front of them (laughs) but actually it's the same as the art of listening that that musicians need that because that's their feedback that and they don't get a chance to do that on stage they can only do that off stage you know, gain that feedback and tune their bodies to do exactly that same thing. Uh, Nora, do you, are there other art forms that actually inspire you in the way that you play and in the way you write? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> do you find your potter? Do you find your pottery inspiring? Oh, like, you're does that so inspire sweet. you in your music? <laughs> She's an amazing wow. potter. Well, wow. I wouldn't say amazing. I'm a weird well, My potter. favorite mug is by you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and my masks are very creepy. Um, your masks are creepy, but your balls are amazing. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to do that in, in about a year. Uh, not really, but I do find that my emotions come out in what I'm making. 
like remember all those weird masks I make? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I remember one that just looked like Satan. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I was going through some <laughs> a time when I made that one, and I didn't intend on making it, but I just like I made this crazy satanic like devil head. It was crazy with like a big tongue. And I remember my friend in pottery class was like, "What?" is going on with you? I was like, I don't know. It just came out of me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so sometimes it just happens. If you tap into something, whatever you're doing, you know? That's a really important point as well, because when we talk about flow, I think sometimes people can get frustrated that they're not reaching that flow Yeah. at the beginning of a journey with something, you know? Exactly. And I think it's really important to remember that the flow comes from the ease that has come from the practice we can then have more and more of that flow. Nora, with um, with jazz harmony, you know, you, you've studied jazz harmony and you know your jazz harmony backwards, but the thing is to actually then to yeah. turn those into, to turn that into songs that, you know, that people can relate to and empathise with. Is that an interesting journey? It's interesting what you're saying, and I've seen this also with a lot of different kinds of musicians, but I can see in Indian classical how that would be a thing. Coming from a totally different place, I've also seen it, with jazz musicians who mm. who learn everything they transcribe John Coltrane and you know they can play it backwards and forwards but I don't want to listen to them because they play too many notes and there's no melody and tried I tried to chase that in college and then I actually dropped out of school because I didn't practice enough and I couldn't face four years of classical juries and and I love that music I'm, you know but I just that's not where my heart was I think I realized early on that I wanted to chase simple things. But when I moved to New York and I was playing piano and singing and playing in the jazz clubs and I didn't have a piano. So I got a guitar and that's when I started writing music. And Shimmick, I mean, working with voices uh, in that, I mean, are you, do you feel that you're doing that more over time or, or is that or are you going, going deeper into your instrument over time with your with your own work? I feel like I'm going deeper into the instrument while also like wanting to reach really far away from it at the same time uh, which is a weird thing just in terms of you know what you were saying Anushka like you know the placement of your instrument in a track has so much I mean I've really struggled with that over the years because the world that we come from is that the sitar the sarod these are lead solo instruments that sit in the middle bang in the middle not a little bit to mm-hmm. the left or the right and, and no one is moving us out no, of there exactly yeah. you know, <laughs> and there's this like you lead the stage and i've always struggled with that because actually that's not who i am like i'm much more i don't want to be the captain of the ship i want to hang out with the soldiers and like make jokes um yeah, i love this I army I analogy for um, music <laughs> 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 You're listening to BBC World Service, and this is Music Life. My name is Jimmy Allen. I'm an American country singer-songwriter, joined by Texas-born, L.A.-based country star Mickey Guyton, Nashville-based singer-songwriter Abby Anderson, and English country artist 20. What is the most important stories you've told in a song, and how did you use the melody, the instrumentation, and the lyrics to convey that story? Abby, you bring it live, and like, and, I, and that's with every new artist when you're starting off. Sometimes you vocally hold back, you know what I mean? Mm. And it's hard, like you're in this booth by yourself, and you're supposed to give the same energy that you give when you have a crowd kind of feeding. Yeah, it's well, and and I'll Abby. say this, like Mickey and Twenty, you guys touched on this subject too. I was so focused on country radio, country radio. Does it sound? Is it what country radio wants? And that's not dog and country radio. It works for a lot of artists. It does. But what I'm saying is I'm not chasing anymore. And and you guys hit it perfectly. If I was so focused on pleasing everybody else, chasing a sound, but I'm done chasing everything. And I'm just excited to, to do what, you know, when I moved to town, I was like, I'm a piano player yeah. and I'm going to make a country Carol King record. And I feel like I'm getting back to that girl yeah. of just me and my piano, you know, so I'm really excited about One it. One of my favorite quotes that always helps me is I never chase other people. I always lead myself. Amen. And that's what you got to do. I had to learn that. Mickey. I wrote Black Like Me Hungover. And I had a writer's retreat and I hate writer's retreats because I feel like they put so much pressure on you to write a song or two songs and a day 
I had just, you had seen the, the shooting of, of Botham Jean in his own apartment. Mm. Philandro Castile. And all of these shootings. I've, my husband has experienced police brutality. And I had all of these things being at country concerts and singing in front of Confederate flags and, and mm. being called the N word for no reason. And them not even knowing who I am. And I was having all of these feelings. And then on top of that, trying to fit in to country radio that yeah. doesn't support women. Like it just doesn't like, no matter what, how you put it, no matter which way you say it, they don't. And I was, all of that was coming down on me at that time. There was still undeniable racism. And so that song, Black Like Me, was based off of a book that I read in college called Black Like Me, written by a white man who darkened his skin through radiation and went oh. to the Deep South um, to see what it was like to be a black man in America in the 1960s oh. during the Jim Crow law era. And so truly that was someone stepping in somebody else's shoes to really see what it was like. Literally. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then I yeah. wrote it with two white guys and a black girl, another mm. black girl. And, and we came together in that moment. And I think musically in that room, I wrote that song. We sat in that room and wrote something and Nathan Chapman got on the piano and my voice really loves the piano. And then he put a pedal steel on the song and it felt like it brought tears to the track. And it was just such a special moment. And I remember when we finished writing it, Nathan was like, well, you know, I think we wrote one of the most important songs of your career and it might make some people very angry. I guess for me, my favorite story is from my first album, Mercury Lane, a song called All Tractors Ain't Green. And it's just about there's different ways to do the same thing, you know, because I remember when I moved to Nashville, people, since I'm black and I'm keeping it real, people want to question your authenticity of how country you are. Like you could take a white guy mm. from LA or New York, put a cowboy hat on him, send him to Nashville, he's country. But yet, you know, I come to town and like, I, I, I hate that every time an interview asks me this question, I stop and say, don't ever ask me that question again. What got you into country music? You never hear people ask, a white male, what got you into country music? It's, they'll just ask, what do you like about country music? I get that question all the mm -hmm. time. So do I, actually. I think people try and call out people that are different. Mm -hmm. Like you say, like if you give an actor a script, each one of them is going to act it or deliver it differently. Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. you're talking about, like you can do the same thing, but in a different way. Exactly. And it, it's just a funny thing to me because people like people to be different and tell their truth, but they also like to come down on it and go, hey, I just want to point out that you are different. Yeah, good. <laughs> one of my songs, the title track of the album, Hollywood Gypsy, it talks about, my because I am a gypsy and like come from that community, I've, always felt like I've been in two worlds. My mom and dad are very different. And I've kind of repeated that same pattern by being English, but going into Nashville and trying to get in. But ultimately being, again, being yourself and talking about the stuff that I've been through and my truth mm -hmm. has kind of connected it's so with people. It's so much more interesting than just- Totally. Singing just whatever some, guy that doesn't really know who you are thinks you should sing like they totally. don't know you know mickey your story about writing your truth mm -hmm. it's opened so many doors and inspired so many people and you're making history and i think that is just a true testament to you know yeah your truth will prevail so be you and you have to be yourself like it's not about what sells it's about what connects You're listening to the BBC World Service, and this is Music Life. I'm Meryl Garbus, one half of Tune Yards. I'm joined by one half of Black Pumas, Eric Burton, vocalist Chicano Batman, Bardo Martinez, and two thirds of the rock group Haim, Danielle, and Esty Haim. How much, if at all, do you think about who's listening when you start writing? Danielle and Esty. I don't think we're really thinking about like an audience necessarily. I think we're just trying to conjure up inspiration when we're writing songs. I mean, my favorite moments are those moments where like a melody or something just kind of strikes you. And it's like, wow, this is a cool idea, you know, but for us, we really have to work at songwriting. 
we have to show up somewhere every day and just attack it in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really like a muscle that we have to flex. Especially on Women in Music Part 3, we kind of collectively all realized that we were individually running away from different things and they'd finally kind of caught up to us. That was kind of the impetus for us wanting to to write about it was our personal experience and how we were dealing with chronic illness, the death of a, of a friend, just kind of being on the road in general and not really feeling like you may or may not have a place in your friend group anymore or in your family anymore, even though we are family. Mm -hmm. There were times when it was kind of hard to come back and like relate to people that we were related to. Mm -hmm. It was like group therapy. Meeting on a lawn, it would crack open our respective journals. We have diary entries on one side of the page and then we write lyrics on the other side so we can just write like read the diaries (laughs) on one side and then read the lyrics on the other side so smart our weird organizational way of keeping things together we had a lot that we wanted to talk to each other about and open up about and it ended up coming out in the music and there were definitely some things that we saved for our therapists we decided that we can't just be like anything goes there were definitely times we were like i really think this is something for Dr. What's-His-Face. Not for the internet. Yeah, not for the internet or like not even for like the relationship between the three of us. I think that there were some things that we realized mm-hmm. that we needed to kind of just not talk about with one another because we collectively were, you know, we wear each other's emotions. I think all three of us are like empaths. And if Danielle is spiraling about something, I end up spiraling with her. And the same goes for Alana and you know, we love each other so much and we're so close that like when any of us is kind of going through something, I think that we all kind of end up feeling that same feeling and almost experiencing that same experience. Eric, what about for you? And I mean, it's it's interesting also hearing the difference between writing collaboratively, let's say, and what Bardo was saying about kind of the vibe, the vibe between band members Mm -hmm. and and that, but um, do you write your, your lyrics solo mostly? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't get Adrian to write lyrics with me to save my <laughs> life. It's just the production style, maybe on my side, I might have a few notes. And on his side, for the most part, I write fairly well under pressure. So I feel just kind of being in the studio and, you know, I'll have Adrian point out like, oh, that's cool. Like, why don't you run with that? And it's very much abstract in the way that we, you know, work together ourselves, that it is just feels really organic. We ride the wave and I get so crazy in the studio. I'm like, when I first went to the studio, I feel like I I kind of, I probably scared Adrian (laughs) because if something's happening, that's really exciting. I'm going to let people know. I'm going to let everyone in the studio know. I go, (laughs) whoa, like I love, I get really excited. And and as far as um, what D&E were speaking to, our pain and joy that we feel as just, you know, as human beings, it's not separate from the next person. And so I feel like the things that are happening around the world, we're all kind of feeling it in this sort of ripple effect kind of way that, you know, I guess if you can just sit and be honest with yourself, whatever comes from your heart is, you know, inevitably going to touch someone else's. So that's generally how I take to the Mm -hmm. writing process. I mean, considering all of your work, how it's giving me faith. You know, I might reflect on Thank you. a little bit on who might be listening, but if I do it too much, I'm, it's gone. The the creative the creative spark is gone. What's dangerous about that is my experience is often really complex, and so I might speak to this thing A and this thing B that are kind of contradictory, but they they have to live in a song together because the song wanted those things to live together. When I first started songwriting, nobody was listening. Eric, like you, I was a busker. I was on the street. I was in subways, you know, in Montreal with my ukulele trying to scream over trains. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about how, you know, someone picking apart my lyrics (laughs) because they could barely hear them. You're listening to BBC World Service and this is Music Life. I'm singer-songwriter Becky Hill, joined by producer Emma Nike, producer Francis and award-winning singer-songwriter Ella Eyre. Which song of yours that you've been a part of has changed the most from the initial idea to the finished track? There's a story, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. 
my experience on this obviously has been my latest single, which we put out at 115 BPM, which was then, <laughs> <laughs> which I say specifics because it is actually quite specific. By the yeah. time it was two weeks after release, they changed it because they'd seen the market was only enjoying songs over 120 BPM. So therefore my song came out which is very rare, actually. I don't think this happens often, but is now in a sped up version of what I'd first released. So, oh. uh, yeah, if, you, if you'd if you noticed, that was- I hadn't um, noticed, but now you've mentioned it, I will notice. <laughs> yes. You know, there's been songs that I've put, that I've written, maybe on guitar or maybe on piano, piano and vocal. And then it's been completely transformed by a producer. Have you guys had any uh, experiences with that sort of stuff? Ella, eh. All the time, like, without being too negative, I think a lot of my first album was very much that. Like, I went into that album writing it in a soul pop mentality. That's the music I grew up loving. That's the music that I definitely wanted to start my career making. Um, and then because of the success of Waiting All Night, which is in no way a bad thing. My, my label then decided that adding a breakbeat to all these soul pop records to try and keep it in keeping with the audience that I just gained made sense. And like, I, I don't think that was a bad idea from them looking back, but I think because those songs weren't designed to be yeah. that way, I, I struggle with them emotionally more than I did when I wrote them because I just, they're not how I heard them. And I think as an artist, sometimes we just have to like let those things go yeah. because the audience don't know that kind of information mm. and they're hearing it for the first time. I try not to get too hung up on like things being changed these days just because, you know, I'm not the one saying that they want to make the changes. So if it fails, it's your fault. Yeah, preach. Life. Right, <laughs> right. Uso. <laughs> Becky, you know this one. So basically it this, my one was the Zara Larson oh, uh, yeah. Ain't My Fault record. Mm. So I wrote yeah. and produced Ain't My Fault with Zara. The original lyric was, uh, it ain't my fault your man's calling my phone. It ain't my fault you can't keep him at home. And it was all yeah. sass. It was just like, we just wrote this song and it was like, I thought it was fire. I thought, listen, it's pop music. Like you're not, you're not giving out Bible verses. You're just... You know, you're just trying to make something that feels good. Her A&R at the time was like, oh, she can't be singing this. Right. Yeah, it was just this whole thing. And so we had to change the lyrics. And like, I'm not crazy about the version that's out right now. It's made me a bunch of money, but you know, that's not the <laughs> I point. Thought that was, I thought that was Zara's decision. Was that her a &R? It was like a whole, it was like a whole bunch of people. I mean, Zara was at the right. front of it, but I did like the original version and it, and, and it was different. Version. It was very different thematically. But hey, if it, if it meant that it was reaching more people and it was, not harming uh, Zara's reputation as far as like a girl's girl, then I'm all for it. Mm. I mean, it worked. It's, I guess that's one of the examples that you can be like, Yeah, oh, well. th things like that, like, <laughs> like you said, Ella, yeah. like have, have taught me to be less precious about those things because it's like, yeah. it's not about me. It's really about like mm. who needs to listen to the song and who needs to relate to it. Yeah. Francis, I definitely ended up with a couple of songs on my first album. I was like, ew, the production just all went a bit haywire. And they just like stuck out like a, a sore thumb. But the majority of it, like I had this song called Don't Worry About Me, which starts with like 38 seconds of acapella. <laughs> they were like, right, we can't do this. Like we can't put it on the radio or whatever. And it wasn't by any means a hit, but it spent like a month or two and A-list and B-list on like Radio 1 and Radio mm. 2 and stuff. And it was super reactive. But before we got to that point, there was like months of like, it needs drums, it needs this, yeah. we need to send it to all these people. And I just cut kept so calm and was like no 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 we don't no we don't no we don't and just let them kind of weave then we ended up just weaving our way back to having 38 seconds of acapella and they just decided to play it and it ended up wow. doing what it needed to do but... all right well <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of that then <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, guys. That Bye, guys. The least fascinating, fascinating I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> fascinating, right? Well, it's because I've been. I would have a lot to come back with that because I always think 
it's a bit mad that people do want to send it round the houses. And it's almost like they're doing that for their own reassurance rather for the good of the oh, yeah. track. Like Definitely. that's, that's, that's where it is. It's like these A&R people, which, which, you know, we, it, you can't live with them and you can't live without them in a way, especially when you're an artist like that. They want to put drums on it. They want to do things like that because it's more for their sake of them going, oh, well, we've covered all bases now. It's the fight between how, what risk you're going to put on yourself as an artist by putting your foot down and what is saying no does yeah. to a label. Your A&R people could have happily yeah. turned around to you and gone, well, if yeah. you're not going to let us put drums and steel frying pans on it then we're not going to release the track and, and yeah. actually you know and it disengages them as well when you don't listen mm, sometimes massively and that's a risk that you take by having your own opinion yeah which is why i just kind of put fascinating let's not talk about this because I, <laughs> I, I could totally just not talk i could I, I could talk about that for so long about yeah, you know same. having other people change your track so much when actually you know that what you're, you've got and what is in the original that you've put out there is best because that's how you've written it because you're yeah. the artist you're listening to bbc world service and this is music life i'm sudanese american musician sin kane joined by musician david byrne producer St. Vincent and multi-instrumentalist Vegabon. Change is a common theme between all of us in this group. Still though, each album and sound feels authentically ours. I started making music like 15 years ago. You know, it was my first time I really went into doing my own thing. And before that I'd been playing in so many different bands and I was very collaborative and I always found myself thinking, oh, nothing is quite right, you know. And I started Sincane as this experience to find myself, you know. So from the beginning, the idea was like, oh, I live in the sandbox and I can create whatever I want. And I found myself making an album and then going another direction completely. And it was like this new understanding of myself. Change for me was important in this really weird way because it was, it was something that I wanted to do from the outset. But... I never knew where I was going to go, you know? So it kind of like created and manifested this new identity per per album and learned something new about myself. David, what does it mean for you to exist in different creative contexts? I grew up with the idea from the artists that I admired that every record's supposed to be a little bit different, which in a certain way, it's nice because it kind of prods you to try something new. On the other hand, it seems a little bit unfair just because you're doing something different doesn't mean it's better and it doesn't mean it's actually good. Uh, and so to constantly just be feeling this pressure to do something different, sometimes you might, maybe you're not finished with the kind of whatever it was you were doing. Maybe you got more to say in that, that world. I'm kind of trapped in that idea and I've managed to deal with it pretty well, uh, sometimes by working with other people like working, uh, doing music for a theater production, which uh, Ahmed, uh, you're doing that now. And um, mm -hmm. I've done that in different ways. And that's, uh, that works that way. You end up having, to, having a very different set of restrictions and rules and whatever. Uh, and, and many times in those kind of situations, it's kind of more about storytelling. Um, you have to imagine yourself as being uh, another, another person, another character, and right from their point of view which is fun, it gives you kind of license and uh, mm -hmm. lets you escape from the idea that you're always writing about yourself. I mean, I know that's what this show is about, but sometimes it gets to be a little bit much talking about yourself all the time. <laughs> that's really good to hear, you know? It's very soothing to hear that. Annie? I would have picked up that idea from you, David, that, <laughs> that you picked up from others, that every record is supposed to be different and, and growth. Now I, I feel so exhilarating at the outset of a record, even if you don't stick to the theme, to sort of start there and go, okay, this is the direction I'm heading in. And then, of course, be open to the fact that it might change completely, but at least you have a starting point. And I've found more and more that with every record, I really get to live in that character, whether it's a couple years and, and watch that character grow. And when I say character, I really just kind of mean something that lives inside of me that's a an ego state or or whatever. It's 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 not as if it's made out of whole cloth or, or a fabrication. It's just sort of a, a part of my personality that gets steroided for 
a period of time. Mm. I find it so liberating and so fun to just live, really live in it. It's almost like you're outside of yourself and you're kind of experiencing this mm. thing, but you're also the one kind of guiding everything. Well, I feel very much inside it. Oh, yeah? I feel more and more. Yeah, I feel very inside it. It feels definitely like it's coming from the inside out. But then, of course, there's the the paradox where you you are object and you are also subject and you're also artist and muse all at the same time. It can get very solipsistic pretty quickly, <laughs> yeah. but I find it just so exciting. Letizia, I, w I wanted to say your last two records I, I loved. I, I was you. so, so into them. And I found it really interesting. Persian Garden mm. was such an organic record, you know, and it like really took me back to my youth, you know, like being in high school and listening to all these guitar records and like super emotional and and then into Infinite Worlds, which was very similar. But then going to the latest record, the self-titled album, which had these beautiful lush arrangements and electronic elements. And it seemed like there was so much growth, like so much change between those two parts of you. And then the album is also a self-titled record, which like I, we've all had self-titled records between <laughs> all of us here. Right. And they're kind of this, these statement records and I, I I was really curious about that. It's interesting because for my last record I really felt when you speak of that growth that happened between Infinite Worlds and the self-titled record I started writing songs making music in 2015 and um, Infinite Worlds to come out in 2017 and this one to come out late last year I just kind of studied a lot. I was more focused and more like, it, it was my entire thing, <laughs> you know, it was, yeah. all, it was all that I did. I really feel like there are so many different versions of me and I want to explore them. And so I wanted to explore what it's like to to play with all these different instruments and, and to make things sound different and to try them for the first time and see what could happen. Because I think there's a really nice thing that happens when I when I go into something blindly or something that I haven't done before. Letitia, you went to engineering school. So do you think any of that informed the way you approach music? Just the analytical aspect of it, because you're taught to be like a problem solver. And and I was a double engineering major to analyze problems in this very um, scientific way. And I think music is very free form in the way that I make it. I really don't assign like a math to it. And my ability to be a producer, my background in engineering was very helpful for the production and more than the songwriting or the singing or even the arrangements of songs. That's so interesting because your music sounds so visceral to me, mm -hmm. you know? And like, you know, engineering is such a cerebral thing, you know, such yeah. a heady and techie thing. But like in that process, you created this thing that's so visceral and like Im immersive almost, you know, the, the, your latest record, it just feels that way. You're listening, listening, listening to the BBC World Service. And this is Music Life. I'm hip hop artist, songwriter, futurist, producer, Will I Am. Joined by Israeli singer and composer duo Static and Benel, grime MC, Lioness, and acclaimed rapper, songwriter, and producer, Lady LaShure. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, the art of collaborations. When musicians collaborate and many different instruments are playing, out of noise comes amazing music. So how did you guys learn to collaborate? And do you feel that you guys are good collaborators? How do you feel about that, Static? I mean, I feel like for me personally, the way I learned to collaborate, because me and Benel is, is a collaboration, right? So, so each one of us kind of has his own way. But I feel like for me growing up as a rapper in Israel, let's just say that back in the 90s and like the early 2000s, I mean, rap wasn't that big in Israel because it's just, I don't know, it's a different culture. So I feel like I just didn't have any other way of doing it if I wouldn't collab. I mean, I didn't have the funds to do anything by myself. So like the few people that were into what was then a niche had to group together to make something happen. So I kind of was forced into collabing, but now I'm collabing with Ben, which is a choice. <laughs> and if we're good at collabs, well, you should tell us, I mean. You've been collabing with everyone here. So <laughs> so I think you guys you guys are awesome and that's a good point that you brought up. Honesty is like the best policy when it comes to collaborating and not 
because if you try to please everybody, then the, the song's gonna suck. Right. You're either gonna please the song, and pleasing the song is making sure that like, hey, this part's not good, or hey, maybe we need to do this, and you have to fight for the song's sake. Right. The moment you try to like make sure everybody's emotions are okay is when the song starts to like suffer. Right. To the queens, how do you guys start your collaboration process? Are you guys DMing people? Are you guys meeting people like at their clubs? Or are people throwing you songs? Or hop, let me get a 16 or an eight bar verse? Like, for sure. Well, I'm going to start with yikes because <laughs> a lot of the collaborations that I've done usually don't get used. It's either because it's too good. This is the feedback that I've got. It's either too good so it doesn't fit or I just don't hear from the people again. And I found that throughout my whole career that I don't really collaborate, not because I don't want to, but I'm sure Lioness understands that, you know, the certain artists, they probably wouldn't even reach out to us because they know we will spin them on the track. I'm just no, 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 hold on, wait, 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 wait. You're, no, no, no real stuff, she's not lying. I was, I was honest when I said that. People <laughs> didn't want to collaborate with the Black Eyed Peas. I remember in 1998, 99, 2000 like it took a long time for us to collaborate with the de la souls of the world that though that was my favorite those are our heroes and tribe called quest those are our heroes but it took a long time for us to figure out that code combination and then the folks that are all over the radio like the justin timberlake that took a long code crack agreed to figure that out like i said earlier i felt intimidated in the room when you guys were when I, when I heard your guys' verses, thank God I was just singing the chorus. <laughs> Lioness, what do you think? What happens is, is when it comes to males, they won't want to collaborate with you. So they might do a collaboration and they might have lots of other guys on there, but they won't have a girl on there. What they'll do is say, you lot can have a female version of what we're doing because they know that we're going to come on the tune and spin them and they don't want that. So you sort of have your little female section over there and it happens all the time. But it's so mad because I remember when me and you first collaborated, Leisha, it was like, I think MySpace days or was it MySpace days? I don't know. I just messaged you like, I've got this idea. Yeah, it was me. It was no, me. it was you, I wasn't it? Female <laughs> fire. <laughs> wow. But um, it's always been that way. It's like, I think it's a blessing and a curse as well to be talented, but be too talented for a girl yeah it's so weird it's actually frustrating i've sometimes had to water down my sound just to fit in yes on a track before because i've been told it's just too much so it's just not going to be used and then that makes me question my talent and you're meant to be good to succeed do you know what i mean so <laughs> exactly it's it, it's a weird one so i just keep myself to myself that's so true story of my life <laughs> Do you guys feel like there's certain things that you, subject matters and um, processes as far as writing that you guys don't want to take part in? Everybody has their own sound, their own direction. I grew up on Missy Elliott. I grew up on Aaliyah. People that would always show you visuals. I didn't ever want people looking at my body. I wanted people to listen to the bars before they looked at anything yeah. else. Um, and I think... I think it's me, Lioness, you've got Sims. There's a fair few that yep. just lyrics and technical ability and just bars. And I have to stay here representing for those people. And also, I get a lot of parents like commenting on, because I don't swear in my lyrics as well, and that's another thing. I didn't choose to do that. It just ended up happening. Music doesn't really influence me because it's never been a thing where I thought, okay, yeah. I need to swear for the syllables to match. It's actually harder not to swear because that fills out a lot of people's words. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to break the barriers, man. This is why Missy Elliott's so important because she could have looked over at Kim and been like, okay, I think I maybe need to do what you're doing. And then people like me and Leisha who grew up on Missy what would we be doing now? We'd be being like Kim as well. So it's really important that you keep to who you are because somewhere out there needs that influence. Wow, that's powerful. That's what De La Soul was to me. Yep. Even though we were signed to Easy e and Ruthless Records, Easy e didn't say like, hey, Will, you're really, you're really talented. You should be a gangster rapper. Put on these gangster clothes. <laughs> you know, De La Soul was like, yo, this is how we are. And De La Soul told me like, okay, it's cool to be me, I don't have to conform and wear these dickies and these, you know, white t-shirts 
and sag my pants. I could I could wear fitted clothes. Yeah. People thought I was from the UK because they were like, "Where you from? You from <laughs> London?" I'm like, "No, I'm from," because I was just so different from my neighborhood block. You're listening to the BBC World Service, and this is Music Life. I'm soul composer and producer Adrian Young, joined by harpist Brandy Younger, bassist, producer, and songwriter Alicia, and DJ, producer, and hip hop icon, my boy, Mr. Ali Shaheed Muhammad. My whole approach to music is just tactile, it's, 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 it's bespoke and it's embracing the concept of human error. It's okay to have those blemishes because those blemishes is what help you connect to other people. I don't like robots in the studio. That's just my thing. Mr. Muhammad. My uncle who you know, who taught me how to DJ when I was eight years old, is a bass player. Uh, Dropped the bass in my lap when I was three years old and I was like, get this heavy thing off of me. Um, He used to have this saying, you can tell a good song even on a two watt transistor radio. And what he meant by that is that even through something as lo-fi as that, a good song comes through. And so those are a lot of aspects that I think about when I'm, I'm making music. But there are a lot of influences. Like there's a line um, that I forgot about from a song called Mighty. And it's, we are of the mighty, mighty people of the sun, you know, and that is such a important lyric. And it, something as simple as hearing that. And being reminded of that shows how great Earth, Wind & Fire was. And listening to that reminded me of being a kid, listening to that music and the feeling I got from every aspect of their music. Their music was theatrical. Their music was a sonic boom that came from some other universe and landed right in my little two-watt transistor radio I used to carry with me all the time. All of that is with me every day, like you and I create, you know, and we have a process that is somewhat autonomous with our process of making music, but it's these elements that have been a part of our lives since we were children. What is your opinion regarding the concept of culture vultures or artists that misappropriate from other ethnic groups in order to create their own identity? Is this something that you are conscious of when you even compose your own music. Like, let's talk about this. Alyssa, how do you feel about that? Coming from like a mix of different ethnicities, I just always want whatever I do to reflect, you know, truth in yeah. in my art. I always made sure I studied the greats before me and really understand where they got their inspiration from. I traveled a lot. I grew up in different countries. I experienced different cultures. I've always kind of had to construct my own my own culture and identify with whatever it was. And in my case, it was mostly music, you know. Always when I create, I always try to respect as much as I can what was before me. And as, you know, as much as I can, trying to carry that intention. And that applies for, like, real life, just as a person and in music. Beautiful. How about you, Brandy? I think they both explained it well. A harpist just wrote me on Facebook last week saying he wanted to play my arrangement of Lift Every Voice and Sing, Mm. but he didn't want to feel like he was appropriating or doing anything inappropriate. Mm. Um, Both that song and another. And I said, well, I wrote the music to be played, you know, and it, but it, it got me thinking because you don't want to disrespect the culture, but you know, what, what Alicia said, you want to, pay homage and really respect where it comes from. Mm. I get a lot of calls to do, can you do a jazz harp workshop for an hour? I'm like, no, because it's not, hey, you play these scales or hey, you play these chords. It's no, you understand where it came from. Where did the music come from? Mm. That to me is, you can't go over that history in an hour workshop of people eager to learn scales. You know, it's just Mm. not, it's not respectful. Ali, how you feel? When it comes to art, you hope that People are being honest and expressing themselves. And at least for me, that's my goal as a creative person is to be as sincere and as honest as as possible. Instead of focusing on other people's intent, I, I try to focus on my own. But when it comes to certain aspects of the creative process, you want people to have a complete and free 
artistic license. But when it comes to being a culture vulture like this, this is very little acceptance for someone who's not sincere, I think. And especially when you know not only yourself, but the people who have come before you have paid a huge price to be able to capture emotions and be vulnerable enough to put it out there to the detriment of their own selves and, and, and selves of their community sometimes. Uh, you have a song, Brandy, called Equinox. And that song to me is just straight blues. I mean, like, obviously, you know, the blues culturally uh, means something to you and it, and, and it emanates in your music. You know, Alicia, like, I watch you play on your clips on Instagram and you are one of the funkiest bass players to the point that people don't play bass like you play bass. It's a lost art form and a style and a feeling that you you have and you uh, identify with. And when I listen to both of your music, I don't look at it as you're appropriating anything. I, I feel the sincerity and the honesty in the music. And I think that's the best we can do as artists. As an artist, should your influence be limited to your own ethnicity? For me personally, just as you all said, it's really about being yourself and being true to yourself. Because we all just don't like people that are being whack and fake, right? And you should be empowered to make your own decisions, decisions that make you feel right. You know, when I've seen you play Brandy, I think about when Ali and I are in the studio recording orchestra. And most of the harpists that we have are white. I've only had one black harpist in my studio. What does that say? Does that say that when you're playing the harp, you are misappropriating white culture, even though there were forms of a harp in Africa? I mean- I was about to say. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. No, the harp isn't a white instrument. Of course, there's a shortage of black harpists as there's a shortage of male harpists today. Mm. But I studied classical music. I studied music by German composers. And, you know, but I think a lot of it is what you identify with. If we get real deep, my, my mom's last name is McNeese. She's Scottish. We don't know where that really, we know where it comes from. But mm. I don't identify with any Scottish culture mm. at all. I identify mostly with Black culture and Latino culture because of where I grew up. Adrian, in terms of like your records, your compositions, you have such a fusion of soul, you know, jazz, blues, rock, classical, even Italian, French styled voicings, you know, from certain soundtracks, for an example, like you implement and bring all these things into light. How, what's your thought process when, you, when you're creating? My thought process is that I take from everywhere, but I don't do it in a way where I'm making a caricature of the culture. I do it in a way where I find myself in their influences. My, my music, and I know for sure yours too, Ali, actually really all of us here, is inspired by records. You know, we see records through the vantage point of hip hop, and this is an optic that recognizes the break or that ill part taken from the records of any genre. So since hip hop is a pre college of all vinyl, mm -hmm. I guess I'm one hell of a culture vulture. I'm proud of it. <laughs> you, you, uh, <laughs> I'm proud of it. Thank you so much for listening to some of the best moments from the last 100 episodes of Music Life. If you want to hear more from these guests or explore our amazing back catalogue of programmes, you can find them all on the website bbcworldservice.com forward slash music life or wherever you get your podcasts.